Uh, let's see. Oh, um, you know, we talked when we first introduced the limit, right? We talked about uh, uh, the, the pathological cases. One of those pathological cases was this case, where we had a function that had a gap in it. Uh, now, uh, of all the standard function types, polynomial functions, rational functions, trig functions, the logarithm, the exponential, none of those functions have this behavior. None of those functions have gaps between, uh, in the course of their domains. Uh, what kind of functions do? Where do I see functions that actually reproduce this kind of behavior? Um, well, uh, we can reproduce this, not in a natural way, but we can reproduce it using branch functions. So let's talk a little bit about branch functions and their behavior. A branch function, and sometimes they're called piecewise defined functions, the function is defined differently over different parts of its domain. Um, and uh, this is the exact sort of situation in which we can generate functions which have those sorts of gaps in them. Uh, so here's an example of that. Here's a branch function. Uh, this function is defined uh, to be this upper branch, well, or lower branch, depending on how you look at it. I'm going to call it the upper branch because on paper it's on top. Uh, this branch here uh, applies as long as x is less than 2, but then when x becomes it, it's 2, uh, it changes, it becomes a new sort of function. Uh, let's go ahead, uh, first of all, let's go ahead and draw this picture. Let's go ahead and graph this function, and then we'll come back and we'll uh, evaluate these limits. Um, you know, once we see the picture, of course, uh, it's going to be pretty easy. Okay, so uh, the cutoff point is at 2. So right here uh, at 2, this, bra this graph is going to be cut into two separate pieces. To the left of 2, I've got this definition. To the right of 2, I've got this definition. So those are two different branch, those are two different graphs. Let's start with the one on top. What kind of graph is this? Line. Okay. Uh, if I want to graph a line, all I need to know is the slope and the intercept. What's the slope of this line? One half. Intercept. One. Okay. So this graph uh, passes through the point one, and it's got a slope of one half. So rise one, run two, there's a second point right here. Uh, but, of course, that runs into the cutoff. So this graph would look like this. This side of the graph uh, branch function would look like this. Up to two, this is the, this is the path that the graph follows. Uh, do I include this point at two on this branch? No. Right? This says strictly less than. Here's where the 2 actually takes up. With x is equal to, now I'm on the new branch. Okay, once again, this branch, what is this, a line again? Uh, let's see, what does this line look like? Uh, slope is what? Negative 1, intercept, same place. So, I don't know. So, if I were going to draw the whole line, it would look like this, right? Here's uh, the point 1, negative 1, so uh, it would look like this. That would be the whole line, but all of this part to the left of the cutoff point is going to be removed, so all of that has to go. The only part of this graph that counts is the part that starts here at 2. And now I'll fill in the circle because this is the point that belongs to the graph and then uh, continuing on like so. So there's a graph of this branch function. Up to the cutoff point, I've got the positively sloping line. And then once I transition across the cutoff point, I've got the negatively sloping line. And the cutoff point itself belongs to this second branch. Okay, so there's a picture of this. Now, let's answer the question. What is f of 2 equal to? Negative 1. What's the limit as x approaches 2 from the left? What is it? 2. Okay. What's the limit as x approaches 2 from the right? Negative 1. There's that path. So what is, what do we say about the limit as x approaches 2, the big limit? doesn't exist. So here's, here's, a, um, 
here's an example, or here's, here's a way to construct a function that has a gap in it. Right? This is a very natural way to construct those things. Branch functions are very common in practice. Uh, but this is, well, uh, we're going to give a name to this next time. Uh, but there we go. There's an example of a function that has a gap in it. And at the point of the gap, the transition point for the branch function, that's where we, the limit fails. From one side, in fact, you know, why does this not exist? Well, it's because the limit from one side does not equal the limit from the other. As I approach two from the left, it's not the same as what I get when I approach two from the right. Now, of course, once I've drawn the picture, all well, that's obvious. The geometry of the limit is pretty straightforward. Um, the question is, can you answer these questions without having to refer to the graph? Um, so here's another branch function. This function stretched across three branches. It's got two transition points. First transition point occurs here at negative two. Between negative two and one, I get a new structure. And then once I pass through the point one, I get a third branch. So this is a function that has three branches. Uh, what can we say about the limit behavior at those transition points? So, uh, first of all, what is f of negative 2 equal to? Which branch am I on? When x is actually equal to negative 2, which branch of the 3 am I actually on? The middle one, right? Here's where x equals. Okay. If x at negative 2, middle branch, what does f equal? 3. Okay. Okay, suppose I'm approaching negative 2 from the left. Which branch am I on? Top. Right? This is to the left. This branch are all the values to the left of negative 2. So this limit puts me on the first branch. The first branch uses this formula. So once I know where I'm making the approach, now I can actually pin this down. From the left, I'm following the path along that upper branch, or the first branch. What is this limit equal to? 3. Now I can do a direct substitution. I just replace x with negative 2, and I see what I get. So as I come in from the left-hand side, the limit is 3. Okay, so I'm coming from the right. Which branch am I on? Where... I'm, I'm, you know, when I'm approaching, I'm close to it. Close to negative 2, which branch am I on? Second one. I'm in the middle branch. Right? These values here, at least, uh, and of course, it's true for, it's also true for that lower branch, but if I'm approaching negative 2, that means I'm getting close to it. So to the right of and close to negative 2, I'm on that middle branch. So now, I don't have to, there's no ambiguity about what this means. As I approach negative 2 from the right, I'm talking about that middle branch, the constant part of the graph, with the limit as x approaches negative 2 of the constant, 3. Okay, so what's the big limit equal to? 3. The left limit and the right limit were the same. And not only that, it just so happens that it is actually equal to the function value. Again, uh, that's not necessary for the limit to exist, but uh, that's the standard comparison that we've been making all along. If the limit does exist, how does it relate to the actual function value? So I didn't need a picture to look at to see that. All I had to do was understand uh, what uh, uh, the limit process entails. If I'm to the left of negative 2, approaching from the left, that puts me on the upper branch where the values are less than negative 2. If I'm to the right, now I'm a, on a, a branch close to two, negative 2, but to the right. Once I know which branch I'm on, I can actually use the formula for that branch and to complete the, the valuation. Okay, what is f of 1 equal to? Yeah. Which branch am I on if I'm at 1 itself? Yeah. So this is the middle branch. The middle branch is constant, so f of 1 is 3. Okay, I'm approaching from the left. I'm approaching 1 from the left. Which branch am I on? Still in the middle. Right? I'm smaller than 1, 
the values on that middle branch are between negative 2 and 1, and I'm close to 1. So close, but less than, puts me on branch 2. So this branch not only is to the right of 2, it's to the left of 1. So this puts me on the middle branch again. So I don't have to wonder what that might be. The middle branch has a value of 3, so this limit is equal to 3. Okay. Now I'm approaching from the right. Now which branch am I on? Now I'm on the bottom. This branch here is to the right of 1. So as long as I know that, then I can uh, make the substitution. If so I'm approaching 1 from the right, I'm on that bottom branch. The bottom branch is defined, or the third branch, the bottom is probably not the best way to describe it, but there. The bottom branch is governed by the formula minus x plus 3, so what is this going to be equal to? 2. Now I can do the direct substitution along this branch, I'm approaching 2. So what about the big limit? Does not exist. The left limit and the right limit are not equal to each other, so the limit fails. What do I see graphically at the point, at the transition point here at 1? If I were looking at that graph, what would I see? There'd be a gap there. The first branch ends at 3, the second branch takes up at 2. So there'd be a gap there, very similar to this gap. But one branch takes up, the other branch left off two different points. So this uh, is an example of a gap in the graph. Um, now there's no gap at the first transition point, no problem there. The two branches take up at the same point, leave off and take up at the same point. But uh, there's a gap in this function at x equals 1. Uh, and finally, uh, one more of those. Here's a function whose uh, um, instead of having uh, branches defined over an interval, here's a function whose branch is defined at a single point. Um, once again, uh, uh, okay, well, first, yeah, let's go ahead and answer the question first. Uh, those are, I think, from what, we, what we've done already, we should be able to answer those. What is f of 0 equal to? Hmm? 4, right? Here it is. If x is 0, f is the constant function. So f of 0 is equal to 4, okay? Uh, if I'm approaching 0 from the left-hand side, which branch am I on? Top one. Right? This includes all values to the left of 0. So, what's the limit going to be equal to? Yeah, so I'm on that branch. Uh, this polynomial expression, so the uh, limit can be obtained by direct substitution. I just replace x with 0, and I get 1. Okay. Which branch am I on if I'm to the right of 0? Same one. Anything except 0 itself, I'm on that same branch. So this branch represents both directions. It's to the right and to the left of 0. So it really didn't matter which way approach. In this case, I'm uh, appealing to the exact same location. So what's the limit going to be equal to? Just like before, same thing, same formula, it's approaching the same point. And so what do I say about the big limit? Equals 1. But it's not equal to the function value. So here's a case where the limit exists but the limit is not equal to the function value. Uh, left and right limits were the same. The breakdown is at the evaluation point. Okay, what kind of graphic structure do I expect to see in this case? Let's go ahead and draw it. Uh, 1 minus x, I think we already talked about that function. Uh, 1 minus x is a straight line, it's got a slope of negative 1, passes through the intercept at positive 1. So if I were to draw the whole graph, I guess it would look like this. It's hard to draw. There. 
Okay, that would be the whole graph. But what uh, when I look at the uh, the branch function itself, how do I make the adjustment? What's different when the branch is taken into consideration? The hole in it, right? Uh, the, the, at the one point here at zero, that's no longer part of this function. In fact, what I've done is I've punched a hole in this graph and I've moved it up to this location. What used to be the intercept at zero one has been shifted up to the point zero four. So that's what's happened to this graph. And again, uh, that's what we saw when we were looking at those pathological cases. Here's an example of a graph of a hole. Not a gap. Well, this is kind of a gap, right? There is a gap here, but this is more appropriately described as a hole at x equals zero because the two branches actually uh, take up the same point. It's just we've ro relocated the actual function value at that point. So all of the, those uh, two pathological cases, the gap and the hole, both of those can be recreated very simply using branch functions. Um, and once we actually, in fact, the, the uh, behavior of those limits give us a clue about what the graph is going to look like. Once we've determined those limit valuations, then it's pretty easy to fill in the details about how the graph is going to look. Um, but I did want to introduce that because uh, I do, we did want need to see that. Um, how do those sorts of functions occur uh, in a natural kind of setting uh, when the standard functions don't reproduce that type of behavior? Well, these branch functions are exactly where those sorts of behaviors can be exhibited. Okay, good. Let's branch functions.